Servus and hello, Matthias here in this. This is single track and yes, Prost people, it is the most glorious time of the year, Oktoberfest. Celebrated by now all over the world, this crazy beer fest originated in München and although I'm not native from there, in my hometown Stuttgart, we have a similar fest called Cannstatter Vasen. After a couple of years and living in Munich, I fell in love with Oktoberfest. Yes, it's crazy, overrun with tourists and the beer is expensive, but it does live up to the hype. Oktoberfest is totally worth a trip once in your life. Thus concludes our tourist tip for the week. And speaking of trips to Germany, for this episode, we are back over there in beautiful Garmisch Pattenkirchen at the foot of the Zugspitze, Germany's highest mountain. Marcel Höche joins us to talk about his incredible FKT run from earlier this summer on the Jubiläumsgrad of the Zugspitze, a most revered and quite spicy ridge that's more of a climbing objective than a run. Marcel is part of the Adidas Terex team and we talk about the advantages of being part of a trail running team and the challenges of getting the sport of trail running recognized by Germany's largest outdoor organization, the Deutschen Alpenverein or German Alpine Club, despite the fact that thousands of people line up to run races all over the Alps and not just for UTMB events. All right, this episode is full of stuff that makes me homesick and I hope you all get the wanderlust. Here's Marcel. We are back on Single Track and I'm here today with Marcel Höche. Am I pronouncing that correct? Marcel yeah. Höche? Yeah, you're Not German. Macy yeah. Pacey? <laughs> Macy Pacey, Marcel Höche, both is fine. So, Marcel, you're calling in from Germany. Where in Germany exactly are you currently located? I'm currently located in the very south of Germany, in Garmisch-Partenkirchen. <laughs> really hard to uh, pronounce for, for non-German speakers, I guess. Um, but some Americans might know it because we've actually got uh, quite a big army uh, base here as well. No, exactly. I was thinking, I think Germans or Americans know um, that the region around Heidelberg, there are a lot of um, army bases and then they know Garmisch-Partenkirchen, right? And um, it, again... It is sort of an interesting thing. I need to work a little bit harder because I think all the Germans that I'm interviewing are coming from the south of Germany and from uh, mainly from the region of Bavaria. I don't think I've had anybody from Schwabland. Um, <laughs> and it's, well, I mean, it, I think there are two sides to it. One, it's, it's curious that I am connecting with all of you. And the other is... Are you actually from that region naturally or were you drawn to it because it's close to the mountains? That's just something I wanted to add while you were, <clears throat> while you were asking like, this question now. Um, you asked me where I'm located right now, which is the very south of Germany, <clears throat> Sorry, which is where most, I would say most, um, German trail runners are also based. Because if you look at it, at, at Germany and its geography, um, you know, it's quite natural that, that we come here because this is the only place where we have some real mountains. But I didn't, I didn't uh, grow up here. Uh, I'm, I was born and raised in, in Bad Lauterberg, which is in the very center of Germany, in the very small but really nice uh, mountain range called the Harz Mountain. So very cool. You, you're saying, and this is another interesting observation, we are going to, and that is a thread of this podcast as we're interviewing uh, Germans, so pointing out the differences between U.S. And, and, and Europe and especially German trail runners and locations is you're drawn to the mountains because trail running you associated with, you associate with mountains. But in the U.S., trail running is not directly associated with immediately with high alpine mountains like I know well, some of the best uh, trail runners live on the East Coast, train, train on the East Coast. And yeah, they do struggle and need to really take into account if they want to run in Colorado in high alpine terrain. But in general, I think we are sort of more spread out and you probably could run trails in other parts of the country too. 
um, as you mentioned, right? I mean, you've got Mittelgebirge. Um, you've got lots of places, but you're drawn to Garmisch-Partenkirchen. I obviously don't fault you because it's a very beautiful area. Yeah, right. But, but yeah, I also do think that um, good and, and passionate trail runners live elsewhere in the country. Uh, may that be the Harz Mountain, the Taunus, or basically anywhere. And that's, that's one of the most beautiful things about trail running is that you that it's the most natural sport that you could ever ever exercise right so you can really do it everywhere and with like somehow minimal equipment like if you wanted to do that i mean you also can do like you know lots of lots of you could like go deep into the trenches of buying very lots of important uh, expensive material but you don't really have to which is yeah what i like about the sports by the way yeah yeah absolutely i wonder if Perhaps could it be, big question that just comes into my head, could it be that in other parts of Germany it's harder to find single track? It's harder to find trails? Like you got hilly mountains, but all of the hiking path and stuff are fairly well established and therefore you don't get the technical terrain? Yeah, that's the thing. Like like me very personally, not us as a you know trail running community in Germany, me personally, I am drawn to the very technical terrain, um, which is, when it comes to Germany, is only located in the in the very very south. Um, but I did also trail run in in the Harz Mountain or the Fränkische Schweiz, where I was uh, living for many many years. And um, so I think it's, it's it's possible there, and and people do get very strong there. I mean, some other strong trail runners, you know, Schwabenland, you just mentioned it, Janos. Uh, Kowalczyk, um, he he trains in Stuttgart. Um, so so those kind of runners exist. Tom Evans trains in not so super uh, hilly parts of of Great Britain in in the, in the Sussex area, right? So it 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 exists. Um, it's just that me personally, I I like to run here more on the on the nice uh, technical single trails more than. In, in the Harz Mountains where I was raised and where, where I know like every single hill or mountain or whatever you want to call it. And um, you might be right. I mean, we, we do have beautiful landscape there, but it's it's only gravel roads. And I and don't enjoy running on gravel roads as much as I enjoy running on, on beautiful trails. So let's, let's kind of circle all the way to the beginning. So you grew up in the Harz and... How did you discover trail running? How did you get from growing up and running gravel roads to mo moving to Garmisch Partenkirchen? And this is obviously a very long yeah. road. Give us a couple couple little highlights. How how does one discover trail running in in Germany? It basically all started um, with my with my parents who weren't really or still aren't really much into sports. Um, so they didn't really see the point in me sending uh, in, in 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 sending me to a, like a soccer club. Um, so all my friends, of course, you know, uh, played soccer when they were little or, or still do. Actually, um, I didn't, and um, so I had to decide for my own, like like what I wanted to do. And for me, it was very clear, like from you know. With, to the point where I actually remember, I always wanted to be outside. I also always wanted to be active. And that's when I felt the happiest. And um, so I found for myself the bicycle, which was like my tool more or less to um, discover new places, um, but also to challenge myself. And so I was biking a lot, um, all the time, every day. Um, had a lot of fun with it. Um, obviously, um, trained my endurance already that, then in, in, in young ages. And then, um, of course, I found some like people I could ride my bike with. And um, it was more or less a coincidence that we, like me and uh, three of my cycling friends said, hey, there's this charity run here in the Harz Mountain, the Oxham Trail Walker, um, which is 100K distance. And um, I, was, I was 15 at that time. And like we said, like, hey, let's, 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 Let's take on that adventure or challenge or both. It was both really, which was so beautiful about it. And um, yeah, we trained all summer for it. And then I finished my first uh, 100K race uh, when I was 15 and had like a super awesome time. And um, yeah, like did a little bit of 
biking and, and running uh, after that um, summer and continue to, to enjoy both. And then I moved um, to Nuremberg for, for, my, for, my, for my studies and my job. Um, did a little bit of both then, but I was doing my, my studies. I had to uh, like move places a lot, like from Taiwan to Nuremberg to Prague to what other places. Um, and so it was really hard to like always bring my bike with me, but I, I was a competitive um, sportsman by, by then. Um, so I said, this running thing actually worked quite well for me. And um, so I, I signed up for, for another ultra trail, like a 50, 50K, I think it was. And um, yeah, fall back into the sports and did a little bit of like um, excursions to, to obstacle course racing and then uh, duathlon and went back to mountain biking and basically enjoy whatever um, I, was, I was doing and able to do. Um, but then was 2016, I was, I was still working with Adidas at that time, developing trail running shoes. And um, so I was, um, gra I, I gravitated around the sport of trail running in my professional life and my private life in, in, in everything. And it was at that time when I, yeah, like literally my, my whole life um, circled around, around the topic of trail running. And I don't want to do anything else anymore right now <laughs> <laughs> so you've you've beautifully summarized and kind of took us all on this journey so i need to i need to kind of go back so your first trail running experience was a hundred kilometer race <laughs> at the age of 15 <laughs> i mean that's insane yeah, basically i <laughs> <laughs> uh, i i mean i mean actually i was I, I forgot like one part i was um i went on a high school semester abroad in to wisconsin um, just be, just before that, the summer before that, and I actually um, was running cross country oh, okay. Um, then. Okay, uh, okay. So, so, so that was that was my first real touch point um, with with running, um, really. Um, but yeah, my what was it then? Fourth or fifth race ever was was the hundred k distance. But to be fair, but to be fair, like I've 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 had like a couple of um, mountain bike races with five or six hours of race time by that, which, which definitely helped to, you know, um, yeah, just make it to the finish line. Really. Yeah. So you, so you were familiar with the idea of racing, putting on a bib and sort of managing yourself, which is very different than if you just go on really long adventures with friends where the, where there's no clock ticking, where you can take all the time that you want, right? I mean, so you, you were definitely drawn to the trail running through the racing, um, through the racing events and through the idea of competing with others, putting on a bib and challenging yourself. Not necessarily uh, at that point, at least um, challenging myself or, or, or racing against each other or others. But um, at that point, you know, 100K, especially if you do it the first time, uh, it, it's, it's more like to challenge yourself rather than racing others, I would say. Yeah, but but yeah, I'm I think I'm 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 like naturally a, a competitive uh, mindset i have a competitive mindset and um yeah so the idea then very quickly grew on me because we didn't do like that bad on that on that 100k race i was now talking about and um so i really came back to that idea then uh, a couple of uh, years later and saying like hey like maybe we should give this another try that is fantastic so now you let's let's move forward a little bit so you have touched on uh, the fact that you worked for or still work for Adidas and you're also part of the um, Adidas trail running team. Describe your position. Are you considering yourself a full-time pro or are you, uh, how does your sort of kind of like work day um, kind of um, play out, if you will? Now it's a little bit uh, easier Um because I now work for an external marketing agency that very closely works together with Terex, but at least it's like on, on two different clocks, like, right. Like I either talk, I either talk to them as an athlete or I talk to them as, as like a, a service provider, a marketing service provider. 
which makes things um, yeah, a little bit easier um, if you compare to how things started when I was still like a product manager and product developer for Terex, um, where it was always the discussion, am I talking to the athletes now as an athlete? Like, am I on my like private clock or am I actually doing my, my, my job as a product manager? Um, when I flew on, on training camps to, to Fortaventura, was I there? Like, should I, should I have taken holidays or is that actually my job and finding out and learning as much as possible about, um, my fellow athletes needs and wants when it came to, to footwear. Um, same thing when we traveled to Hong Kong and like what, what places we, we traveled to. Um, so that was a little bit harder then. Um, also when, you know, like I, I was finishing my day at, at Adidas, like my original work. And then my friends from friends and fellow runners from the US would kind of, you know, like wake up and tell me about how their morning run and the new prototypes were going. So I was basically continuing. Was I working at 11 at night or was I actually talking to my friends and, and, and talking about my, my favorite thing to talk about, trail running? Um, you know, I, I, I kind of guess it was both. Um, but, but yeah, there were times in my life where the differentiation between trail running as, as, as an athlete or as a trail runner and my, my actual professional life um, was was a little bit uh, tricky in, in a good way because, you know, I, I'm in this super grateful position where uh, like all my life and I'm 24-7, um, you know, talking and, 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 and discussing things that, yeah, I like the most, which is, which is awesome. So now your main job is working for a marketing agency, but you also some, you also part of the Adidas Terex team. In that position, is that semi-pro? How would you see yourself as an athlete then? I don't know. Like define pro and semi-pro. I, I I don't really know. Like I I do what I what I love um, as an athlete. I'm I'm as I said like I'm lucky enough to when it comes to marketing, it's not like generic marketing. It's it's always um, about the topic of, of trail running or like outdoor activities um, as well. Um, so I just do what I love and have the possibility through this to, to meet with awesome people, travel around the globe with them and, and, and compete again, like basically to sum it up, like just do what I, what I love doing the most. It, it, it is an interesting challenge because our sport is growing so much. And in some respects, the demands on the athlete um, to deliver and compete on a high level um, are there but our sport cannot really support yet a lot of full-time athletes who do nothing but training and racing right I mean even almost most people I know they all have a job on the side in some way or another and I mean it's perhaps good for balance um but if you think of all the other sports professional sports um yeah i mean if you play soccer for Bayern, then you're not also working for a marketing agency on the side right yeah i mean there's there's times in my life where i i wish i was a full-time athlete and sometimes i'm quite grateful for for not only having this one identity but also have this 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 other identity to rely on when you know like i fucked up a race or i'm i'm injured or sick or whatever you know or there's a pandemic you know things like this um, seem to happen um so then i'm i'm quite happy and grateful and also about the experience i make as a as a like a leader of a small team you know in that marketing agency it's it's also a lot of fun and you you learn things and again it's it's all circled around the topic of of outdoor so it's it's not you know, something completely, it, it, it's still always about my, my one and only passion, um, which is cool. But I also think, Matthias, that um, it is becoming easier and easier for trail running athletes around the world to actually be able to, to live from, from being an athlete. I, I sometimes think about it, like, shouldn't I give it a try, you know, for two or three years or whatever, um, because th th there is some ways. Um, 
unfortunately, it's it's only the brands um, really supporting us here, and not like in in other sports, brands and either federations or clubs. Um, that's that's something we don't really have in the world of uh, trail running just yet. But you know, the 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 sports of trail running is is growing, and and brands um, of course have realized that. And so the investment that they make in the development of shoes and the marketing uh, strategies and campaigns and also in the athletes that they sponsor, um, yeah, that, that investment is just growing, which allows more and more of us to, to actually live from it. Yeah, I mean, that's good to hear because we obviously, we love the sport both, to, I mean, for me as somebody who's, who's never going to get paid for trail running, I'm not personally worried about that, but seeing the overall sport grow and seeing the excitement and also enjoying watching the spectacle that is following big races. It's good to see that the brands recognize that and put their money where their mouth is, if you will, and really build a good support structure there. Now let's talk about pressure. Um, when you put on an Adidas Terex outfit do you feel more pressure to perform than if you would put a t-shirt on that you would just find in the closet like how do you how do you balance that out do you feel like you're running now for adidas or do you still run just for yourself i, I think as as soon as you start not running for yourself anymore you you will not perform in the way that you that you should um let, let me start with 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 that um i think it's really important that you that you run because you love running and not because you get paid for it or because somebody tells you to run or, or whatever. I don't think that it would ever work that way, at least not for me and, and probably not for, for most of, of the people that run trails and that I know um, as well. Um, and if anything, putting on that Terex uh, uh, kit is actually relieving a lot of stress for me because I know a, I know I have this uh, support, um, you know, the, the, the one team, as we call it, you know, there's fellow athletes who have been through whatever injury you could ever have. They've been through it, like one of them has. Um, we have people to rely on both mentally as well as, um, you know, whenever it comes to, like my coach, for example, he's also part of the trail running team, uh, Dimitri Media, for example. Um, we have people traveling the world with uh, with us um, as as physiotherapists and and all these things. So, and and all these people they know the 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 personal struggles that you have that maybe your social media followers don't see or or you know people deciding whether or not you should go to any official world championships or not. You know sometimes these people don't see that, but but my team gets it, and and this is such a such a huge source of, of relief that, that comes with, you know, somebody not only seeing you as an, as an athlete, as a, you know, like running machine that, you know, has to perform a specific UTMB index, um, but as, as somebody who, is, who goes through up and down just like they do for themselves. You know what I mean? No, I think that yeah. describes it actually really, really well in something I didn't really think about it that, especially once you have a social media follower and people sort of expecting you to perform, right? It starts getting really thin because to those people, you can't really share um, how you really feel or they don't understand that, yeah, that you're human, that you might have an off day or that things don't go, uh, go so well. And then if you show up at a start line, go fly to a race or participate in a, at an event and you are with a group of people that that um, truly you can rely on and they have your back and they support you I mean that's a huge yeah that's a huge relief that is an interesting you know, it's an interesting yeah. way yeah, of looking at it and I think it's actually only the way that you see it because I, I don't think at least the followers my followers that decide to interact with me on, on social media I don't think any of them really expect anything from me you know they 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 of course they're happy with me and of course you know they they're probably even sad when I don't perform the way that that I 
that I expect from myself. You know, like I think most of the time you are the only person that expects cer certain things from you, and and this expectation isn't always healthy. And if it stops being healthy, then I think I think you have to uh, you have some work to do. Really. Oh yourself. no! Ab no, absolutely, absolutely. I I agree. So. Let's take a break and talking on the, around this whole professional running because one of favorite topics here on this show is talking about FKTs. And for people, we need to set the scene a little bit. So Garmisch-Partenkirchen is in the south of Germany on the foot of Germany's highest mountain um, and Germany's highest elevation points. It's on... The, not the entire mountain is in Germany, so we, we we don't fully claim it. But the Zugspitze is right outside Garmisch-Partenkirchen, and one of the most iconic climbs, trails, um, routes um, along that Zugspitze arena is the Jubiläumsgrad, and you did the FKT on it a couple months ago, and it's one of those really hard things to translate to uh, Americans because in Germ in German hiking parlay the Jubiläumsgrad is one of the most iconic routes that people know of that people are aspiring to do but it's also not easy it's decidedly more than a trail than an, an easy run right and um yeah. two months ago you put the fkt down and looking on the fastest known time website there aren't a lot of fkts that have been listed on this this is definitely this is a big deal so congratulations foremost but i want you in your own words sort of describe a little bit uh, the importance of that route and how you decided to take it on i love talking about that because you know, like if 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 you are in, in in Garmisch, you know, like you look up the mountain and and you see this super iconic silhouette of the Jubiläumsgrad. Even if you like, if the weather is fine and you drive south to Garmisch, even when just exiting Munich, you really see sometimes this the super majestic uh, ridge um, here and. Yeah, I mean, now living here in the place where I always went to with my parents for, for summer vacation, the Jubiläumsgrad always felt like something super special to me. Like whenever I look up on my balcony, when I like write some emails or whatever, and I look up and it's the Jubiläumsgrad and I think, man, this, this thing is so beautiful. And, um, it, and it really is. And um, so I think it was very clear to me at some point that I wanted to, to pursue that FKT, which I thought at just over seven hours was like a really, really ambitious time already. Um, set from from a local who's been to K2 and, and whatnot, like so like a guy who really knows um, how to move in the mountains. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I <laughs> that one day it was it was a Sunday and like the weather was awesome. And I said, I, I'll give it a go. And um, just to 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 um, for the course recce actually just you know to to see because it's what you need to know is like usually you know making it to the top of Zugspitze for two, some people that's like a two-day hike then if they ever do the ridge which many people decide they will probably never do in their life because it's a, a, a UIAA grade three minus don't ask me what that translates to the 510 or like the like the American scale. It's probably like a 54, 53, 55, something like this. So most people wouldn't consider it trail running uh, anymore. Um, yeah, but this only starts after like the 2000 vertical uh, meter climb to Germany's highest mountain. And then you have like a five kilometer um, ridge ahead of you. And then still a very very technical uh, downhill from here. So it's a 20k, um, 26 kilometer uh, route with 3,000 meters of of elevation, and a lot of that being quite technical via Ferrata. There's a small glacier. Um, there is, like I said, like some easy climbing sections as well, and a lot of exposure. Like 
there's most of the time when being on the ridge and, and that's the terrain that I love, you know, that's why I moved from the Harz mountain gravel roads to, to Garmisch is because like this is the terrain where I really thrive, where I really feel the most alive. So there's sections where on both sides of you, 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 you walk on a like half foot wide ridge and there's like 500 meters left and 500 meters right of you, there's just nothing but, but clouds. There's no room for error in, 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 on the Jubiläumsgrad in many sections, right? In, 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 in many sections, there's no room for error, definitely. And um, yeah, I mean, and, and, and that's what I like so much about trail running and what I like now, m many years after my cycling career, if you want to call it like that, um, the, the possibilities or the limits of trail running, they're just, you know, there, there's no limits. Like some might not consider this trail running more anymore but the way that i see it is that i am like as any like as every other trail runner like we are still shaping the sports of trail running and we we apply it to a specific problem if you want to call it like that that the mountain or nature gives us and we apply whatever creative tools or possible uh, way of 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 transportation of transporting ourselves to that scenario and that's when you when when you do something that in this specific way no one has ever done before which is which is so great about the the fkt so um the fkt now is at six hours 25 minutes um over 40 minutes faster than than the previous fastest known time and um you know this is like <laughs> So much faster than a regular hiker would or you don't really hike the Jubiläumsgrad. I think people call themselves mountaineer if they if they do the Jubiläumsgrad. Um that's like a three or four day um adventure for, for most people, the whole valley to valley round trip. Um and yeah, now now there's snow. I was actually considering uh, doing it again because the first time I tried, you know, sometimes I went like over a tower, but I should have gone right, or I should have, or I was going left, but actually the way was over the ridge directly. Um, also took a little bit too little water, um, which made me suffer like on the on the ridge itself for a long time because there's simply no water, um, and I like dried up quite a lot. So I I think if I go all in, um, sub six hours is is feasible. And um, I would be very keen to try that. <laughs> there, there we go. Sub, <laughs> sub six hours on the Jubiläumsgrad. It is fascinating, though, how our sport, you were talking about it with the beauty of trail running, how we sort of are in a, in a place where at the very e smallest and simplest, our sport is just putting on a pair of shoes. It doesn't require a lot, right? Yeah. We don't need a ton yeah. of gear. and. We can find a little city park and a couple gravel trails and can enjoy that sport. But at the same time, we have room to push that sport forward into areas that that touch mountaineering, but are still not on a danger level that requires, um, yeah, to you to travel to the Himalayas for it, right? And I think, I think yeah, there definitely. is something beautiful in that. And what's beautiful too is that you can do this without needing to wait for UTMB to build a race there, right? You don't. You can participate in challenging yeah. yourself in this absolute beautiful terrain, and it doesn't have to be an event. You can just say, if if yeah. I want to be in this mindset of finding the route, figuring out what I need to take, what I can do, then I can just take myself at the time and do it. And yeah, it is, it can be dangerous. Yeah. You got, you know how to move in the mountains, but it, um, yeah, it's absolutely beautiful when you sort of complete sort of this, an iconic route like this. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. There's no, there's no referee or no, you know, given playing fields or course, director or whatever you know there's the mountains the the mountains are given and and whatever you do within the mountains is is up for you it the mountains require you to to think for yourself you know like 
in, in traffic or whatever, you have like the, the traffic regulations that, that apply for everyone, no matter if you're like a, an 80 year old dude or, uh, you know, like a professional race car driver, you know, everyone can go, must go, has to go at this, at the, at, at the given speed limit. And these kind of regulations don't exist in the mountains. You, you move in the mountains as you see fit. And yeah, that's, that's, that requires you to, to think for yourself and, and to, to be free because there's no rules and nobody would, who, who could ever enforce them there, which is a very, a very seldom situation to be in. There, there are no human imposed rules, right? There are sort of the rules of the mountains, right? The mountain yeah. um, demands a certain attention of you. You need to be smart and understand what if what you can do at a certain given time but aside from I, I, and um, beyond that it's just it's just you and and your project when you completed this since it's such an iconic route how did the german mountaineering climbing running community react is that something that people pay attention to or did it not register because it was trail running and people don't really talk about trail running because germans like paragliding and serious mountaineering yeah i mean i mean yes there, like like you said there there are some human ma made um, rules in the mountains like how you should behave and and i think they are there for good reason because On, on on good summer days when Jubiläumsgrad is is busy, there's the helicopter there every day, right? And and rescuing someone, and and there's people dying on the Jubiläumsgrad as well. So yeah, it's 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 good that there are um, certain rules. Um, but again, I think these rules are like quite general, and you are allowed to move outside of these rules if you know how to behave. And I think it, it, it seems that I have proven that like I, I can move on on terrain like Jubiläumsgrad different than pe most people would. Um, so um, I had nobody saying like, what the hell dude, like what's what's going on and I, and I posted some 360 degree camera clips on on my Instagram can, uh, channel which kind of showed that um there really was no room for error in in many occasions um but I I did I did not see a single comment or whatever saying like hey this was irresponsible or you're sending like a, a bad um example for for others to follow whatever um which for people who don't know me i would even have understood if if those reactions were were coming my way um they weren't um but but also there was just no reaction of course from the deutsche alpine like the german alpine club or whatever because yeah um <laughs> yeah i i don't think they care too much about about trail running to be to be very honest and and also don't really care about records and 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 performance and and all these things which is fine um well but it's but, but it's, this is a fascinating topic because they do if it's climbing if it's mountaineering if there is a new speed record on the Eiger north face they would talk about it yeah maybe and i mean i'm the i'm the i'm the the co-founder and vice president of the of the german sky running federation right so my friend wendell and me we are the entity um sending Germans to the international sky running uh, competitions um, and like we, we are like a, just a very small association uh, trying to get a hold of some roof federation that would like help us with I don't know money or status you know being able so that we are able to call ourselves like national team when we go to these kind of um, competitions um, And it turns out to be very hard. Like in, in most other countries, the 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 the, the sky running associations or foundations uh, federations are part of the alpine clubs of that country. Um, so we tried to to talk to the DAV um, to to basically become a member there um, because that's how it's done. And it's not that they they don't do it 
with other sports, like we said, like the ski mountaineering guys and the sports climbers and the um, expedition guys, they are, they are all under the roof of the German Alpine Club. And for some apparent reason, it's not, impos it's, it's not possible for us as the, as the Skyrunning Federation to become part of the DAV. Um, I'm not sure if they don't want to or ca really cannot. I, I don't really know. I don't, I don't want to make um, that, that decision or call. Um, but we, we continue to be for ourselves. And yeah, so the Alpine Club in Germany um, keeps, a st keeps its distance from, from trail running, which I think is, is their loss because you have so many more trail runners in Germany than you have probably ski mountaineers and professional or, or sports climbers combined, maybe even. Um, and I think this trend is going to develop in that direction. Um, so, so I think that they are, they are missing on, on a huge opportunity to, to connect with, with people, with new target groups and to, um, how to say, um, maybe modernize the, the outdoor sports a little bit for, for generations to come. Um, but but maybe it's a it's a it's it's a continuing process for for the DAV to to come to that um, opinion. Well, and to kind of paint the picture for our listeners, the German Alpine Club is one of the largest nonprofits in the world. I think it, it is a massive organization that's been around for over a hundred years. They have sections all over Germany. They are in charge in partnership with the Austrian and the South Tyrolean Alpine Club of over 300 huts um, that have been built and are maintained um, for generations. And so they are a hugely influential voice in the mountain outdoor world in Europe. And they are doing an incredible work in maintaining trails and having a strong focus on the environment and pushing for smarter ways, non-car travel to get to the mountains. And so there is, they're doing some in incredible work, but I've been following them from a far because I'm obviously sitting here on the west coast and I've been surprised that um, indoor boulder halls have been so supported and pushed and um, the climbers that have been going to the Olympics they have been a big focus on what they're doing which isn't really about the mountains itself if you think of plastic holes in the gym and <laughs> there's a big conversation around mountain biking and e-biking and stuff. And I've been always wondering, like, where is trail running? Where is that sport? Because it's so much closer to basic hiking, right? It doesn't require a whole bunch of gear. So it would perfectly fit into the the portfolio, the mentality, the mission of an organization like that, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. And of course, I asked myself that same question many, many times, being without um, any support, uh, structural or financial, or whatever, for, for our federation of the Skyrunning Federation. Um, maybe the sport of trail running is perceived by them as, as, I don't know, too rebellious or unrespectful to nature or whatever even though that would be that that couldn't be further away from the truth right um most most people that i run with are super keen to preserve nature are very spiritual um very mindful all these good characteristics that i would see in in any other outdoor sports man or woman as well um so so yeah i i i really don't understand i i've I've talked to some some people in in those uh, structures, and um, yeah, trail running just it's not on their radar at all. Yeah, I don't know. Perhaps let's hope that it's only because the sport is still too young, and not because it might be perceived as invasive. Um, because yes, one could see 
if the only thing that we are looking at with trail running is the masses of UTMB and mm. the spectacle of tens of thousands of people running around the mountains, then perhaps we might get afraid of our little trails. But trail running is so much more, right? It isn't just yeah. always the big spectacles of these races. And even then, I mean, the Olympic Games are supported too. And the <laughs> Olympic Games are a giant commercial yeah. entity that is pushing itself into every locale. Yeah, definitely. And the way that the way that I like last time I checked, it's it's basically the um the objective of the Alpine clubs to to bring people outside in a in a happy and and safe way so that they can, you know, um enhance their lives and their health. And I think trail running is one of the best things that you can actually achieve that objective by. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And you need, you, you're only using the existing trails. You're only using the existing infrastructure, right? You don't yeah. require ski lifts to get your mountain bikes up on uh, top and then special made, made trails. Yeah. We don't put bolts into the rock, right? Yeah, no, exactly. Right. I mean, you even use the huts in between if you go on a multi-day run or uh, yeah. you, you want to stop over, right? So it would align, it, it It seemingly is something that aligns itself perfectly with the mission. So it's it's curious um, that they haven't, I mean, I don't know, perhaps it's because they're big and it's bureaucratic and slow moving and trail running is just not um, on the radar enough even though trail running is big in Germany too, right? I mean, yeah. you were just doing a race. Um, I mean, the average races in Europe, we here in America, our races due to being on public lands and with permitting, right? Our biggest race, Western States, only has just over 400 mm -hmm. runners. But you get races, r events that are way off the radar of UTMB and still get 2,000, 3,000 runners come out, right? Yeah, just here in, in Garmisch, we have the, like, not going up Zugspitze like I did for Jubiläumsgrad, but actually, like, circumventing the, the whole Massif, um, 100K, but you also have distances of uh, 70, 50, and 25. Um, I think on all distances together, there were, there were 4,000 runners running on that, on that Saturday in July. I mean, this is these are massive yeah. numbers, and yeah, I've, I'm doing research on American races, and we barely have. I mean, yeah, if you if you add multiple distances together, you might get on over a thousand runners, but you barely get into four digits. And over in Europe, so many events have these kind of numbers, and. Mm. The shorter distances are super popular too. It doesn't have to always be the big distance, right? I mean, you've run yeah. plenty of shorter distances that are highly competitive and fun and you can run more during the year. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, fascinating. So, so we've talked about your incredible FKT at the Jubiläumsgrad and it, I mean, yeah, I'm fascinated. I mean, I'm listening to a couple German mountain podcasts and the Jubiläumsgrad often comes up and, yeah, nobody uh, talks about um, FKTs on this, right? Even though FKTs in itself is something that Germans do pay attention to, right? I mean, you are very, in within your trail running world, FKTs is something that is not a foreign American thing that nobody knows or talks about. Not a, not since the pandemic it isn't. Um, be, before that, yes, there there were some FKTs around, but they were sporadically spread over the map of Germany, and and most of them weren't that competitive at all, I would say. Um, so, yeah, but that's how it was uh, before the pandemic. During the pandemic, um, that that changed a lot. Um, I mean, yeah, obviously, yes, trail running is, is, is a thing that also happens in, 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 in Europe as well, but of course still American trail running influences a lot that, that we do and, and how we see things. And so this concept of, of FKT um, really like came over then finally during, during the pandemic. Um, Which, which, which was awesome. I did uh, 200K 
um, routes myself during during that time, and I had a fantastic time. You know, you don't need the right director, you don't need the starting line. You you just do it on a day that like fits your best, and you don't have to travel far to to a starting line, or whatever. You know, you, you you just do it in in the most natural way that you could ever do it in in you know possibly even unsupported way, which is yeah, just like almost another discipline, I would say, um, of of trail running, which which I found uh, very very interesting to do. Um, both of these FKTs, by the way, were in the Hartz Mountains, so so close to the place I was. Actually, one route was even going through the town where I was born and raised. Um, yeah, um, but but yeah, then. What I found even more interesting is actually like the FKT of the Jubiläumsgrad because it's just so technical that no race director ever would would put a route there. So it's it's um, th that's the main reason why like this this FKT was really so so important to me because it's it's something completely different and and the and the direction into which I see myself uh, develop over the next five years more because there's like you know there's uh like a couple of guys um in in germany or in my adidas terex team that are like that are able to run faster than me but if you then deduct the people that can securely and quickly move in that terrain still that number reduces dramatically and um yeah which which makes me stand out a little bit more and but that's Definitely not as important as the fact that I just in, enjoy moving in 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 technical terrain. The the technical more the more technical the terrain is, the the more I really enjoy it. So, yeah, you um, you're trying to find yeah. your niche, right? I think that makes yeah. perfect sense, right? To sort of saying, okay, where how can I play to my strength? How can I play to my interests and to to what I what I truly enjoy doing? And definitely. Um, that I mean, if you like that kind of terrain, you're probably never interested in coming running Western states, right? Western states is <laughs> <laughs> generally, generally, terrain like the Western states would not really interest me too much. But the Western states is the Western states, right? Right. I spoke um, purely about the terrain because it's it's very okay. runnable, right? I mean, yeah. supposedly very runnable, right? It's not it's not technical, and FKT sort of give you the option, as you're saying, to find routes where no race director would put put a route, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But for you, if you would come to the U.S., Western states would be the play the the race to tackle to to aim for uh i mean there's definitely some other races that um would interest the interest me as at least as much um broken arrow for example um and if it came to 100 miler then of course also the hard rock but like right now i'm still quite far away from the mindset of hey let's run 100 miles okay <laughs> to be honest yeah. So, um, so but I, I think my time will come. Yeah. I like it. So, what is currently your sweet spot? Um, because, as I mentioned, as American trail runner, you very quickly, especially if you run on that level of high profile as you're running, you have to embrace 100 miles. So, you say you feel it's going to come, but you feel you're, you're a few years away from it. What is sort of your sweet dis when it comes to racing? What is your distance that you love racing the most yeah i mean i think i think i for myself had had the same mindset when i started trail running which is why i like i said i started running 100k distances when i was 15 and when i was fully back to the sport of trail running at the age of 19 i think and com com like fully focused on that i i did the 100k which is maybe like the 100 mile in in america like so to say um, and and I really thought I I had to do it and I should do it, um, and I'm not sure if I matured as an athlete or decided or found out for myself that I have to do what makes me happy and not what I think that I should do. Maybe it was that, or maybe it was the fact that uh, people 
also started to understand that running shorter distances doesn't mean that it's easier. You just run them so much harder. Um, and and there's and and again, that's like the beauty of trail running, right? It's it's so like whatever you think trail running is, is trail running. Um, and if that's like a vertical K or like 100 mile or whatever in between there is, or even above 100 miles, and that's that's all def different disciplines. And there's different runners with different um, strengths and weaknesses. And I think it's absolutely fair to to play into your own strengths and your own interests. Um, and so I think, or I know that right now my sweet spot is anything between three and five hours on, on, on technical terrain. So is, what kind of races in Europe are, are in that terrain? Um, give, us, give us some names of some, some races that are, um, yeah, that really reach that technical terrain that are not just, you know, um, distance based. Um, I mean, of course, like the whole Skyrunning uh, World Series and, and Skyrunning um, international competitions. I just come home from the World Championship of Skyrunning at the Vera Sky Race in, in Italy. Um, I did Tromso, which I liked a lot. Um, I'll probably do Snowdonia next next summer, which I'm very, very interested uh, in. Um, and then there's a couple of races that I really wanted to Limone Sky Race, Sky Masters, of course, um, also very technical, um, three and a bit hour ish, um, Madeira Sky Race, um, all, all these events, um, Matesins, um, Hochkönig Man, Kaiser Krone Trail, like in Austria, a couple of very strong races. Oh, there's just so many beautiful races out there. Now, I love that you name them because, you know, the way you as a German look at America and sort of only know the really well-known and big races when in reality we obviously have dozens of races from small organizations, right? We as Americans, we look over to Europe and we basically know UTMB, Eigolter Trail, Lavaredo, Mozart, right? I mean, we don't really know much else. And it's obviously a little bit simplified. Obviously, we know a few more, but it's good that you name these races in the Alps because it gives uh, the listeners something to Google, something to look forward to. Because I often, I love the Alps. I want to go back every summer and I often... Um, asked by others, you know, what race should I aim for, especially with UTMB getting harder to get into. And I'm like, if you if you want the crowds, if you want that, that you know, that massive focus of that spectacle, then you have to run a UTMB race. But there are lots of other races that are absolutely fascinatingly beautiful and stunning locations, super well managed, right? And you can really, you don't have to go try to get a stone here and then the next point there and stuff. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Iger, you, you mentioned Iger. I mean, Iger, of course, is, is, yes, it's well known, but it's like not, not overhyped because there's definitely reasons why that race is, is so well known. It's just a beautiful race. The 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 course, the scenery, um, but also how it's put together, and the competition is there. It's it's beautiful. And I'll be next. I'll be I'll I'll probably be back uh, next year as well. Nice. So by you kind of focusing on shorter distances, you have the ability to put more races on your calendar. What does an average year look like for you? How many races do you target? So, <clears throat> I mean, basically my, my season um, being a professional or like, you know, being part of a team, professional athlete, if you want to call me like that or not, um, we, we start um, traveling to warmer places already in, in April, <clears throat> um, do like a race or there um, in, in April, May, before the real trail running season in the in the northern part of the Alps or in the, in the Alps really um, only start in in June really and then continues until well September maybe and then we start traveling again to go elsewhere to to kind of belong the season a little bit longer so 
my season now really is like nine, yeah, nine months long. Um, so there's probably anything between six and 10 races per, per year where I would focus, like put my main focus on, on two or three, really. That's a lot of racing, right? And if you would be running 100 mile distances, then you could never do that, right? Um, I, talk, I talked with Hannes right. a number yeah. and he was talking about how, well, this year at UTMB he was injured, but how he had the last year sort of had a race too soon before, uh, too close to UTMB, and he didn't feel really fresh, right? I think Killian can do it, but he's the only one who can like bounce back and forth and do it <laughs> all the races. But in general, when you do the big distances, you can do you can really focus one or two. American over uh, over here, we are saying that. If you really focus on Western states, you are not fully recovered to also uh, do well at UTMB, right? Um, yeah, I, I don't see how it, it could ever work running both. I mean, yeah, you, you said, you know, there's a couple of athletes who can, but um, yeah, I, I don't understand how that works, to be honest. <laughs> but shorter distances, you you can sort of add a few a few races, more races on the calendar, which when it comes to traveling and comes to being in that atmosphere and being with your team is obviously super fun, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we, <clears throat> most of the races I do is like are now really with a team. So there's anything between, I don't know, 10 and, and 30 people of us. Um, and it's not only teammates, right? Those, those guys are my closest friends really. Um, so we spend 10 to 12 weeks every every year at amazing places doing the things that we, we love the most, um, talking about the, th the thing that we like the most. Um, so, yeah, that's that's just beautiful. Yeah, that sounds like an absolute incredible place to be in. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. It's end of September. Do you have anything left on your calendar for this year? Yes. Um, I'll be I'll be traveling to back to South Africa in in one and a half weeks. Um, I raced the UTCT there last year and and won. Um, and this year I'll be going back with it. Like this was like a solo trip last year with like friends who are not professional athletes. Um, this year I'll be going back with the team, with Tarek's team, um, for both races, the Cape Town Trail Marathon. I'll be running 46 kilometer there. And then six weeks later, we have the Ultra Trail Cape Town, and we'll be running the 55K. Nice. That is yeah. also a race in an absolutely incredible, spectacular location. Yes, definitely. Especially for, for us <clears throat> here in, in Europe. I mean, we have a beautiful winter. If you like the snow, we have a beautiful summer. Um, but we have a, a couple of weeks or months where... We have neither, like it's just gray and, and rainy and, and, and cold. Um, so, and, and at the same time in Cape Town, it's just like beautiful, most beautiful summer ever. Um, so I really like going there at that time of the year last year, which is why I'm very happy to, to, do, to do the exact same thing this year again. Fantastic. Well, I wish you all the best um, for these last couple of races for the season for you. Before we go, tell listeners where they can find you so we can put some links and show notes i'm not a really a big fan of, of social media so i i just i i really just do uh instagram to be honest um but but here you find most of the things uh, that i do um so it's macy pacey with an underscore m-a-c-y underscore p-a-c-y yeah i think that's the best place to to connect with me and to keep up with the things that i do perfect um we'll link that in the show notes marcel thank you so much for coming on single track this was an incredible conversation yeah thank you so much it was was really fun i need to do some uh, research into your German Sky Running Federation um that's that's incredible that you that you're starting that up yeah i was just like so annoyed that we wouldn't send anyone and then um, I just like dug deep like pretty much a year ago to see like what needs to be done to actually be able to go there and, and, and bring some fellow German guy runners with me and so I just did the whole the whole thing of, of 
uh, founding that association and getting in contact with the um, International Federation, which was like just super helpful. They, they welcomed us with open arms saying like, guys, whatever support you need, you'll get it from us. We're so happy that you Germans are now finally, finally, finally on board. Um, and yeah, we did pretty great now this year in, in three international competitions, youth world championships, sky um, snow world championship and the European championship just a uh, few weeks ago. And yeah, it's been a blast really every single time. Sport is very splintered right now, right? It is very confusing. There is the Golden Trail series. There is the UTMB thing. Spartan has is trying to do things. Like it's kind of tricky, both as a fan on the outside and then also as a pro to kind of figure out where to position yourself and what to do, right? In, oh, I, I think we all would love to have like the World Championship and. Whoever wins that world championship is like the best trail runner on earth. Like I think, I think the idea somehow sounds quite cool. But and again, like I think I said that like many times in that recording now is that trail running is just so much more than like this one discipline or this one race or this one race series even. So we have runners, you know, like really just. Um, thriving in so many in, in that discipline or that other discipline and I think just one race isn't really able to to recognize the full beauty of, of trail running so sky running is something very different than running UTMB or Western States and that's okay true and in that sense our sport is actually closer aligned with climbing right I mean Alex Honnold hasn't been up um, on Mount Everest right I mean Within the world of climbing, there are so many different disciplines and people are focused on what they're good at and they're the best in their that discipline, but it doesn't immediately translate to a, a, everything else. And that is actually good. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, right? I totally agree. 